what's our sales process and, you know, are, are people following the sales process? And I think where a lot of time ends up getting, um, you know, perhaps maybe wasted on, on what you what you might consider micromanagement is where people maybe don't have a shared understanding of the process, and then people are sort of arguing over details versus versus arguing over the over things that matter. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I've got Joel Stevenson with me, and uh, we're going to discuss leading with productivity as a sales manager. Joel, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And by way of introduction, Joel Stevenson is uh, the CEO of Yesware, which uh, which is a great product that I'm familiar with, and and, uh, he's also a leader in the sales productivity software space in general. Um, prior to Yesware, he was the general manager and founder of Wayfair's B2B division. He's the, the host of the Hard Sell podcast, uh, where he talks about new and, um, and also tested sales principles to boost productivity. So excited to get into this with you, Joel. Uh, first question, what, uh, what are the common mistakes, the most common mistakes that you see salespeople making when they're trying to boost productivity? Yeah. I mean, a common one, you know, when, I mean, and I, this is sort of like the, the founding thesis of really our whole, the whole technology space in which we operate in, which is this sort of sales tech space is like really to drive productivity. And I think when, when people first get into it, it's, you know, if you used to, you know, for example, send all your emails one by one, and then all of a sudden you realize there's a tool that can help you send that many at the same time. Um, a lot of times what we'll see is people just sort of, you know, I don't know, uh, get punch drunk on power or something, but it's like all of a sudden you go from sending, you know, your 50 manual emails a week that were sort of very highly tailored or curated. And then all of a sudden you start blasting out 5,000 or 10,000, or, you know, we've seen, you know, numbers that are even higher than that. And so what ends up happening is you're, you know, you, you lose all the personalization, you end up in spam jail and you don't really end up accomplishing a lot of your objectives. So yes, like you did, you did actually save a bunch of time, um, in terms of not, uh, you know, actually having to send those emails out manually, but then, uh, you didn't send out good emails. And so you actually, you know, sort of defeated the purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I remember that moment in my sales career when I, when I found when, uh, when I, when I could stop sending emails one by one, like, you know, copying, pasting your individual piece and, and mail merge became a thing. That was, that was magic, but you definitely, you can get drunk on that punch. You gotta be careful. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, um, well, and, and I, how can, how can a sales manager avoid micromanaging their sales team? Well, I, I tend to think of it as, you know, the, Ideally, a sales manager has a good handle on what folks are doing. Um, and so, you know, you shouldn't necessarily have to check in with people to say like, oh, how many calls did you make today? Or, you know, how many contacts did you make? I mean, ideally, you hopefully have systems that are set up that feed you that information so you can just go get that. And so, you know, that, and, and if you're really having to spend a lot of time I think managing people on the sort of like the hustle or activity metrics, and maybe there's a, there's a deeper problem there. Like you shouldn't have to be constantly, uh, you know, having to tell people to, to, do the amount of work that sort of the expectation or, or that, you know, is sort of proven over time to, to lead to good results. So I think you sort of take that off the table. Um, then I think, you, you know, you start to get into, well, what's our, what's our sales process and, you know, are, are people following the sales process? And I think where a lot of time ends up getting, um, you know, perhaps maybe wasted on, on what you what you might consider micromanagement is where people maybe don't have a shared understanding of the process, and then people are sort of arguing over details versus versus arguing over the over things that matter. And I'll I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So, you know, let's say for example, 
you know, you had um, a meeting with somebody and, uh, you know, it was for maybe it was an hour and the person was a VP and you're in sort of in this part of the sales process. Um, you, you know, if you're using any sort of, you know, sales or, or digital selling techniques today, like most of that information should be available to people. And so really it shouldn't be so much an argument about like what's going on in the sales process. It should be more of a, ideally that time is better spent with saying like, okay, well, here's where we're at. What do we need to do to advance to the next step? Or, okay, like we're stuck. Like I get it. We're stuck. So how do we get unstuck versus I, I, you see, I see a lot of teams sort of wasting cycles, just arguing about what's true and what's not true. And I think then you do start to get into the micromanagement where if a, if a manager starts to distrust what the reps are saying um, and doesn't 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 believe that they're going to go execute the processes agreed to, then yeah, then it's sort of like okay, well, I got to obviously I got to do this myself, and that doesn't scale uh, particularly well. Makes a ton of sense. And what would you say, you know, in terms of productivity, how how can you create the best office environment for a team to be more productive? It's it, yeah, it's it's maybe a an even more interesting question now that a lot of offices have been disrupted, right? So it's like it used to be, you know, I think all across San Francisco and, you know, Boston, a lot of the tech hubs you could find. And this is, you know, not that dissimilar from the sales floor we had at, uh, at Wayfair. You know, a lot of young people and a lot of Nerf guns and a lot of beer kegs and, you know, people that are, you know, on the phones, you know, driving, which driving a lot of activity, which, you know, I think uh, the, the, the good parts of that culture were the fact that sales involves a lot of rejection and you've got to be able to, to maintain a positive attitude. And I think, you know, being around other people that are going through the same thing and the ability to say like, ah, like whatever, ignore that guy. Like, you know, he was a jerk or, uh, well, you know, like, you know, keep going. I think there, there's a really positive benefit to salespeople getting that, um, uh, peer feedback about like, it's okay to fail and, you know, just keep going and, and keep kind of driving towards success. And in, in the remote world, it's, you know, I, I mean, there are ways I think for people to recreate some of that stuff. I mean, whether it's, you know, through um, Slack or teams or daily standups or, uh, you know, group called, but I, I think it is, it is a little bit tougher um, to do. Now there's, you know, there's a flip side to, you know, you're a yin and a yang to all these things. I think sometimes the, you know, the in-person cultures can become a little bit more, you know, like uh, sort of the stereotypical like sales bro culture. I think it can be, you know, not healthy in a lot of cases. Um, you know, sometimes the, the extra, the extracurriculars um, can start to take over because there's a lot of distractions. But I, to me, I think the, the most important element for particularly a, a, a sales team that has any sort of velocity behind them is how do you how do you get people to support them to, to support each other um, in you know the the you know 99 or you know 500 no's before you get to the yes yeah absolutely um, and and how do you shape a team's values to get them to help support one another and and, and therefore be more productive yeah, it's, you know, sales has a history of being a little bit more of a zero sum game. I mean, at least, you know, from, from when I came up in selling, you would sort of see this sort of like the early days of, you know, uh, enterprise software, like kind of the dot com era, that type of thing. You know, you had companies back then that, you know, would sort of explode onto the scene and then, you know, reps do really well one year, they make a bunch of money. And then the next year, the comp plan changes so that everybody's got to do a lot more work to sort of make the same amount of money. And, you know, and there's, you know, sales is typically graded on a curve, right? And so if you get too many people that are way on the one side of the curve, then the curve is going to shift. And so I think there, there's always this tension in sales between, um, you know, trying to sort of do a set of things that might be differentiated versus helping uh, the, the rest of your your teammates. And so I think part of it is maybe who you're, who you're choosing for your sales team. And I think as, you know, the, um, as sales, I think has gone a little bit more towards 
in, informed buyers showing up versus uh, salespeople having to spend a lot of time trying to get buyers interest in the first place. Like I, I think Salesforce did a study a, a few years back that showed that, you know, buyers are now showing up, you know, halfway down the sales cycle or like twice as far down the sales cycle as they used to. And so I think you end up now with the, the more talented salespeople might be a little bit more consultative or like me might be a little bit better listeners, um, you know, might be, you know, a little bit more empathetic uh, to particularly the the buyers. And I think that's going to generally lead to a person that is going to probably support their teammates a little bit more. Um, but then the other part of it is how you're setting up your comp. And, you know, I think for particularly for tech companies that are growing, to, to have equity be a meaningful part of the salesperson's comp and make sure that they understand how that works and how, you know, when the whole team benefits, they benefit and, you know, and how they can grow their career when new people join and they can onboard and they can sort of rise up the ranks. I think that that's a really important part for the salespeople to internalize because it's, if it's just simply about whatever I make on my W-2, uh, and the, the really savvy ones are going to realize that, you know, they're going to actually maximize their own personal income by maybe others not doing quite as well as them. But you know, when you create a bigger pie, then I think you can start to change some behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with between, you know, equity is a key thing there and, and, and pointing to the career path and, and, and empowering people to, you know, to, to see how if they, these times when they're coaching and helping their, their peers, um, they're actually also developing themselves as leaders. I think that's that's an important connection to make as well. And if, if you want to kind of foster that environment where people just aren't only in it for themselves. Yeah, I, I tend to see too that um, for whatever reason, you know, some of the younger generations coming up into sales, I think, seem to be a little bit more wired towards collaboration. Um, more so than, you know, some of the sales cultures that, you know, I was a, sort of a part of, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. It does seem to be, you know, like people have a little bit more bias towards working together. I don't know what that is, uh, like what drives that, but uh, I, I tend to see a bit of that. Yeah, I've noticed that too, and, I, and I'm not sure why that is. I I kind of think it's because, you know, we're, we're probably about, we, we, we came up in the, in the same age, so we're probably cut from similar cloth, and we, I, I think... You know the this the, I think a part of the reason it was so individualistic in two thousand and four was was because that's what the that's what people were coaching to that's what they that's what kind of the environment that people felt would be the most efficient and get the best results since they were kind of making it a comp making it more more competitive and less collaborative mm -hmm. um, and maybe today. You know, maybe it's maybe it's the connectivity of the of the office place when people are more like wired together or, or you know maybe, maybe it makes it easier to and, and to or maybe just culture shift to do it in, in in these environments i'm not sure yeah yeah i think i think so i mean you tell, i think that, you know there's been some surveys that have sort of come out that um you know, millennials and uh, I guess, you know, Gen Z that's now just starting to hit the workplace that they tend to care a little bit more about the company's purpose and, and uh, you know, what the, like what they're doing outside of strictly the work aspect. So I think there's there's something in the, the in some connectivity there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that makes sense for sure. Um, I, I think you, you also have to, as a leader, gear, gear your whole, a lot of the messaging much more around that and kind of pay much more attention to that and it, it, hr is, has be has gone from you know paper processing to one of the most important areas of your organization yeah that that's 100 percent correct I, I sometimes think about it as uh you know there's strong hr and weak hr and like in my mind weak hr is yeah they do payroll and they process benefits and they deal with you know whatever sort of comes up paper but like strong hr is like a full member of the executive team and cares about the strategy and understands the strategy and works to bring people aspects to bear on that strategy and is a is just as important of a strategic advisor as everybody else on the exec team and that that's my preferred uh, mode of operation. I think you see more, more, and more companies adopting that now. Yeah, I mean, you know, 15 years ago, if you asked someone, you know, hey, when should you bring in your first HR person? Like they would have said, oh, around employee number 50. And if you asked asked around today, I think a lot more people would say, oh, you know, 10 to 15 people, you got to have somebody in there doing HR, office management, and you know, watching out for people and, and 
you know, having their ear to the ground and keep their fingers in the pulse. That's right. Um, especially with all the challenges today with, um, you know, the great resignation and just uh, keeping, keeping young people, especially engaged in, in their jobs. Um, yeah, there, there's another, um, uh, a, a, a company, uh, scout.com that's been remote for a long time. Uh, the CEO's name is Nick Francis. And so they've, they've had a lot of work at this and he sort of talked about, you know, the, you think you're going to save a bunch of money going by, you know, getting rid of your office and going to remote, but like, actually it's way more work, um, for the HR. Like you really have to be much more intentional about the way you deliver HR in that environment. And so, you know, you're not going to save as much money as you think, because you need to now go invest money in all these other, in all these other places. Oh, I'd say it costs you more money. Like office space isn't that expensive. It never was. I mean, in San Francisco it is, but in most of the country, it's not that bad. Uh, you end up spending way more money on, you know, other things if if you're remote. Well, and field sales teams that the, they're an interesting group in this discussion. Um, and they obviously the listener of this podcast, but they a lot of field sales teams have been remote forever, right? The, yep. Just by by nature, they it's fifty people and. You know, one, they're spread across the whole state or the whole country rather, right? or, or, you know, this, this team covers California and this team covers the Southwest and this thing, you know, so they've, they've always been kind of scattered about. And uh, so they've, they've been dealing with uh, and dealing effectively with a lot of their remote ish work issues that people are just bumping their heads on right now. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, so you mentioned before, uh, uh, sales processes and, and kind of the sales playbook that you that, that you use and how important it is. What what would you say? Um, what are the most important sales processes to implement? How do you go about implementing them? What do you what do you recommend the most in terms of uh, sales processes? Yeah, I mean, there's many. Uh, I mean, I think you you got to start with you know, who you're selling to and, you know, what your sales, you know, what, what are your closed one pro like successful processes look like and, and sort of start from there. I mean, there's any number of, you know, methodologies that people could use as a, as sort of the, the, the thing to, or the tent pole to build a process around. There's, there's a, there's many ways to go about it, but I think the the, what, what I tend to tell people is that, you know, in general, the more things you can measure, the better off you're going to be. Um, and especially in a, you know, I think even field sales now is probably, you know, even if you're in the field, you're probably doing more work from your computer, emailing people or, you know, on phone calls or whatever than you used to, particularly, you know, due to COVID. And so there's a lot, there's many more measurement points now available than there used to be. And if you can start from a place of, of measurement points, then you can start to, to iterate on whatever that process is. And so if you, you know, if, you know, and then I think it, it's really about experimenting. So if you say, all right, well, like, we're going to say after we do, uh, after we have the discovery call, we're going to try to email this case study because we think it's a hard hitting case study and that's really going to work well. Um, and then instead you could say, all right, well, instead of the case study, we're going to try to do this other thing. You know, and oftentimes this happens organically within a sales team, just, you know, you know just by the nature of, of salespeople trying to improve and, and get better. But if you can start to then say, okay, well, we've got, you know, experiment A and experiment B here and experiment A now did a lot better. Um, why is that? And if, if that's really a durable improvement, we believe in it, then everybody should be doing, everyone who's, who's not doing, you know, A should now go do A. And if you can, if you can get that type of a motion going in your company, um, this gets back to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier about, you know, salespeople wanting to share successes and, and see their teammates improve. If you can start to get some of those activities happening within your company, you know, whether it's, a, you know, the way you handle a sales call or the way you, you know, followed up or, you know, maybe a, uh, uh, an email campaign or whatever it happens to be, you know, is if you can unlock, you know, a slight conversion rate gain from one step to the next, you know, you're going to do better. And then if you can do that for your whole company, I mean, I think that's where sales managers can really have a big impact. If you can sort of identify those things and the reasons why they're working and then get those shared um, across an organization, you can really start to see things, um, you know, you can get to repeatable, scalable process pretty quickly. Makes no sense. It's almost like uh, A-B testing, like a marketing team would do, but within a, a sales team's processes. Yep. 
Yeah, very, very similar. And, uh, you know, and, and even, you know, some of the, the exact same, uh, some of the exact same techniques work, right? So like, if you're, you know, if you're going to do a follow up email, you can look at what was the reply rate? And what was the open rate? And how many people clicked on the link? Or how many people went to the attachment? And how long did they spend on the attachment? And there's, there's a whole, you know, you, I mean, particularly, you know, if, if you're operating in those mediums, there's a whole universe of, of analytics that, that's available now. Yeah, that that's uh, you know I've always kind of said the best the best salespeople are also also have marketing skills. If you can put, if you drop them in a marketing job, they do just fine, and and vice versa, um, because they, you know, there there is so many overlaps. And if you can, and a lot of the skill sets from from one of those career paths uh, often often is needed in the other one. Yeah, I I tend to think of sales as you know being a little bit you know, maybe being a little bit more analytical than it used to be, you know, whether that's from the, you know, the rise of sales tech or just the way that, that you know, sales kind of gets done these days. But, you know, you probably remember the, you know, the early days of ERP where it was like the person with the, this, you know, the steak dinners and the Rolex and the, you know, I've got a bunch of relationships, you know, was the, was the one that was often successful. And I, I, I see very little of that now. Now it's when you, when you go see the really successful reps in an organization and you like they talk to you about well here's my process and like here's how it works and like here's how I'm trying to get better and it's a little bit of a different different beast now I think absolutely I mean so well cer- certainly in software I, I think uh, the the, so- the software industry and and the way things get sold there is it's it's very different than say how a medical device gets sold or how you know uh, you know a new type of machinery gets sold they they they. Uh, so, software has definitely become, and I think a lot of that's because the prices have fallen. I mean, when you know, when when we were selling software twenty years ago, it was like a million dollar price tag. Now yeah. it's always like you know under a hundred bucks a month per seat. <laughs> yeah, so right. It's a it's a different world, I think. And so it's it's moved from kind of those big ticket whale hunting type sales reps to um, more of like a throughput process oriented, um, you know, kind of kind of riding riding the Riding the wave type rep. Yeah. Well, in, in some of those industries, like the one you mentioned, like medical devices, I think is sort of, you know, my understanding is that's been, you know, it's been more consultative for a long time, right? Because in, in some cases, the, the rep is in the room, is sort of in the in the OR with the, um, with the doctor working on stuff. And so there's a real trust there and there's a level of, you know, expertise and qualification that comes um, with that type of a role. I think it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah, depending on the depending on the device, I think. I mean, if you're selling new shoulders that have to be put in people, you have to. The doctor's like, "Wait, where does this screw screw go? Uh, what order do you do this in?" You, you you're supposed to be in the OR helping them. Whereas if you're, you know, there's other things that I think are much more, are, are maybe just a, a similar price point, but uh, you know, you don't, you don't actually you're it's 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 more about the relationship, or it's more you know, it's less about how consultative you are and more about the the access or um it, it, it kind of depends on the on, on on the area of the industry i guess but uh it's it's interesting to see how these things shift and shape over time right yeah yeah i think even in, in some forms of you know distribution uh where like you're you're fighting for shelf space or you know, whatever else, like there's a lot more data that's available now about like wh- how you're trending versus somebody else and shelf space and market share. And I think mm-hmm. from, I'm, my guess is, I don't, you know, I don't, I haven't really spent much time in that particular um, discipline, but my guess is that the best reps there are the ones that sort of look at that stuff and understand it and go have a good business conversation with the owner of the, you know, liquor store, or grocery store, or like whoever it is about like, here's why, here's why you should allocate more shelf space to us versus, you know, X, Y, Z brand. Yeah. I think we, because we've gotten so much better at collecting data, it just wasn't impossible 20 years ago. Just, there, there weren't tools to do it. Um, so you, you couldn't run stats in the, you can't run stats on data that hasn't wasn't collectible, right? Um, and I think that's one of the things that technology has done is it collects vast warehouses of information that we can then work with. I think, yeah, it's it's funny. I, I was talking to somebody the other day. I'm like, I don't believe they still teach geometry in high school because statistics is the th- is is the kind of math that you know it's it's stats has become so much more important because we have so much data to run stats on. <laughs> like, yeah, like, uh, I mean, I, I feel like. 
that's the only kind of math I use really other than like, you know, arithmetic, I guess, but like, I don't use algebra. I don't use trigonometry. I don't use geometry. I don't use calculus, but at least, I mean, in, in, in my role, plenty of people are still, still using that stuff, but, uh, you know, in, in my, in my day to day job, I don't use it. Yeah, same. Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I spent so much time in Excel and like other, you know, we've got some other, you know, kind of big data type, you know, analytics tools that we use. And yeah, that's that. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the last time I used actual math other than to help my kids learn actual math. <laughs> Which doesn't count. If the only place you use it is in school, it's not a real, it's, it's not, and the world's not using it, right? Yeah, yeah, that's I, right. I, uh, I definitely, yeah, that, that's jumped out at me. I'm like, yeah, stats. It's, uh, if, I, if, I, if I could have gone back, if I could go back and take like five more classes on any one thing or get like a second major or something, it would, it would definitely have been in stats. Yeah. It's just, I'm in so many meetings where I'm like, oh, how did this work again? Yeah. Confidence intervals. I was taught to, I was taught that years ago. I don't, it was 20 years ago though. I don't know how to do it anymore. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, Bayes, the Bayes theorem. I feel like I'm never going to get Bayes theorem right. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff like that. I remember in um, on my MBA, we had this uh, really awesome, uh, you know, kind of like analytical marketing professor. And there was, we did this whole, whole segment on how to do a regression the right way and like how to really do it sincerely and eliminate, you know, collinearity and look at all the residuals and like really, really do it the right way. Uh, this is the stupidest thing. Like I'm never <laughs> going to do this, but sometimes I look back and like, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at a more complicated data set and I'm like, like shit, what, what was it? What was that rule about, you know, <laughs> skewness of data? Like, is this actually a bad, like, I think this is good, but maybe this is actually terrible. Yeah, um, there's ways to test it. it there, yeah. there, there are a bunch of tools that some, some smart professor tried to put in my belt and I was like, I picked it up and I was like, I don't need this tool. I, I'll learn it for the test, but I'm not going to put it into, into, I'll put it into RAM, not long-term storage. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, no, that, that's definitely one I could review. <laughs> But, uh, so, so would you say, um, are there ways to measure how efficient a rep is being with their processes and, and with uh, their productivity and, and, and do you try to correlate that with, with their quota achievement or their general achievement in, on the team? Yeah, generally speaking, um, you know, we, you know, back at Wayfair, we had a much bigger um, data. So we had, you know, about 400 reps there when, when I left. So it was a pretty, pretty good sized team. Um, we, we definitely saw a core, I mean, there was, um, it was almost backbending at some point, or there was sort of like a, you know, a point of diminishing returns, but especially in the early stages where like you're going from like low activity to like average to above average activity, there's a strong correlation between, you know, the amount of effort that you're there, the sort of the work output relative to the results. Um, and then eventually to get to the real elite levels, you have to have the full level of work output. Plus you have to be really good at what you do um, in, in addition. But what we found in the, in the early stages was that, that yes, like productivity, which, you know, generally you couldn't achieve the levels of productivity if you weren't being smart about how you were working. Um, it's difficult to get to the, um, to the levels of output, particularly the levels of quality output um, that, that, the, that the better reps were seeing. And so that would be the, you know, the first place we would go look for problems is, okay, well, is the, you know, is, is the level of output you know, appropriate. Um, if not, then that that's a set of things that we have to work work through. But then, if you know, once sort of the, the base levels of output are there, then it's like, all right, well, why are, why is yield from point A to point B for this person much lower than their peers? And then the, you know, that's when you you know, good sales managers get into sales coaching. They pull some calls. They maybe look at some emails. Um, you know, possibly even talk to some customers, you know, so really start to, you know, do a call together. They really start to get some feedback and find out like, okay, well, like person seems to be productive. They seem to be on the right track, but there's, there are uh, technique issues or something that, you know, is, is incorrect here. that's causing problems. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it, what would you say? So we, we're, we both are CEOs of, you know, sales efficiency software effectively, obviously very different types. What would you say are if, to the sales leaders out there or salespeople out there, what are some 
some types of sales efficiency software that are that are really worth taking taking uh, taking a look at and seeing if they would you know because he, because you think they would really help them out and improve their their situation we have you know our, we we can put ours aside right so you know I, obviously we we do routing and and mapping for field sales people and 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 you do uh, why well, I, I just I, I actually I should, I should let you describe describe what you do exactly with the emails and the tracking and all the things yeah, we're um so we're we're you we're we're a sales productivity tool really focused on engagement and so we're we're gonna integrate deeply into your inbox, whether that's Gmail or Outlook, and then we'll do sort of very simple things like let you understand who's opening your emails and then bridge that into more complicated things like what series of communications is driving more meetings for you, and then sort of you know, if you're a Salesforce user, we'll take all that activity passively and sync it into Salesforce so you don't have to do that, and then we have some sort of lighter integrations. Um, with with other CRMs as well, um, and you know I think like the the ones to me that um, that are interesting are you know there is, is stuff like you know I try to think about like where are there places where you can get really good information that can help you be a better salesperson, and so I think the the conversational intelligence space is is a really good one. So um, you know tools like Gong where you know you can get uh, you, you deeply integrate into um, you know, into a video call and you start to get some analytics back about what's going on. Um, you know, other tools that are maybe further down the, the revenue intelligence um, tree, like a Clary, where it's sort of taking in all these signals and trying to f- figure out from all these signals, like, is the deal trending or not trending? Um, trying to sort of take forecasting maybe a little bit um maybe have not so much burden on the rep to say like, oh, now it's in stage three to basically try to figure out from all the signals that you're getting in what's what's really happening there and then try to identify places where, you know, there's um, there's opportunity for approval. Like, oh, you're, you know, you've only talked to one person in this deal. And what we typically see is that you talk to five people in this deal. Um, so stuff like that, I, I think is really, is really interesting. And then we're, you know, we're, we're trying to do, you know, more of a push ourselves, um, this is a a sort of future state activity into more like really core to-do list management. Um, You know, I think of, you know, for reps, no matter what type of rep you are, if you're in the field or or if you're an inside rep, uh, you know, that the ability to follow up appropriately and to make sure that nothing slips through the cracks uh, is so important. I I sometimes talk about it as like forced or unforced errors. So it might be that, you know, like in tennis, so like a forced error might be, well, a competitor came in and they undercut you with some ridiculous thing. There was no way you're ever going to compete with their prices. They're just buying the business. Like, okay, well, you know, nothing I can really do about that, you know, 130 mile an hour sort of down into the, pin down to the corner or something. But the unforced errors are the ones where like, you just forgot to follow up or, you know, you, uh, so you, you know your your customer maybe got distracted and then you never you never sort of went back to them like you never really like you didn't sort of keep going with it until they you got a, a strong signal that says that there there wasn't something happening or you know you didn't prepare well enough for a sales call because you didn't block out the time in your schedule to get yourself ready for the call you know all that type of stuff I think is um, is so critical and and we haven't seen anything that's really great at that yet. Um, so we think that's, that's, you know, either something for us or somebody else to develop over time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was actually, I, I was going to ask, I was like, yeah, what, what do you, I mean, other than the CRM, which, you know, I think in theory kind of does that, um, what do you recommend to do? What, 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 what is the software that you recommend for following up and keeping track of all that? Well, I, I, my, my thing is still a bit of an old school thing, which is, um, I mean, I've done like numerous trainings on these for, for sales and other people, but the old uh, getting things done system by David Allen, I think is just a gem for salespeople. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I think that the thing that is good about that system for sales is it's all about um, managing your commitments. And, and David Allen talks about this concept of like the app, the active professional probably has 250 commitments and a commitment might be something that you've said you're going to do for yourself. It might be, you know, you're, you know, it's something that you got to follow up with. It might be, you got to delegate something to somebody. It might be something that you're waiting for somebody else to, to get back to, but they're all commitments, right? And if you think about, you know, 250 commitments and the ability to manage that in your brain, 
versus in some kind of a trusted system, I think is, you know, it, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of silly. And so, you know, with all this extra mental overhead, trying to manage all that stuff, instead of spending your mental energy on the thing about like being present in the moment with this prospect and asking great questions and understanding their business and that sort of thing. And so I, I still, I still find that that's, one of the best comprehensive systems that I think works great for sales and whether you do it on a piece of paper or whether you do it in, you know, uh, you know, Google to do or to doist or, you know, whatever it is, like if there's any number of systems that, that support that. But I think, you know, having just some sort of a framework that you use, I think uh, is great. And we're, we're trying to think about ways to, you know, take a framework like that and adapt it to more of a, a sales use case. Interesting. Very cool. Yeah. We, we've, uh, we, we've supported some things along, along those lines within our products, but, it, but I, I wouldn't say there's any kind of comprehensive product that I know of. I, mean, I still use a, uh, I use a Google Doc for a lot of stuff to keep yeah. it, to, to, to juggle all the different tasks. And pro- it's the prioritization of the tasks, right? It's like, and there's, you know, 15 great to-do list softwares. Um, I, just, I, I haven't seen it. It's, it's quick for all these little millions of little things that have to get, up, get done all the time. And nothing's as quick for me as a spreadsheet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, I think it, you're right. It's like it, it doesn't so much matter the medium. It's like it's the, it's the work that goes into getting the stuff onto the page, uh, you know. And it's like, are you know, do you write you know clear to dos so that you don't have mental overhead later? Do you spend time every week making sure that the list is still relevant? You're clearing out stuff that doesn't work and adding things that you know as you think of them. To, I mean, it's all that stuff that is is really the important bits. Yeah, I think there's lots of ways you can do it. They, one of the important things is just having the system, like you say, like the getting things done system or, or some kind of consistent thing that you're doing to stuff that's in the same place. And you know, it's got to be a rhythm to it. And you got to have it all consolidated in one spot. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I, I got to believe for, you know, for sealed, I think it's even harder for field salespeople because you're always running around, you know, going from one thing to, I mean, I, my first job I was, I covered uh, uh, the city of Tampa for a telco. And so I was constantly driving, you know, here and there and doing this and that. And um, that's exactly you know, that, the kind of person that, that uses our product and, and listens to this podcast for that. Matter. Yeah. And we used to have, you know, I used to have the giant map book to try mm-hmm. to, because this is before GPS, I used to go have this thing like how do i get to this weird place and you know you have to go oh well now you yeah, gotta go to page 50 uh because this way you went off the map and and you, you sort of found I mean, you you, you realize where, where people are but i think it's such a challenge it's like well how do you like if something pops into your head like how do you capture that thing you know and so it's like whatever your rhythm is whether you're using you know um you know alexa or you're using you know google assistant or you just you've got a good way to, to write it down i think a lot of the voice capture technology i think can be really good dictation you know types of stuff can be really good for um field sales that are constantly on the move to make sure that they can, they can grab that stuff and, and sort of organize it later yeah well we we um for the types of people that like have a lot of to do's like that are we, we, we've kind of created like a to-do list on a map. That's one of the features we created. Mm. Like we have like this follow-up system where you can be like, okay, so by date, when are things due and how important are they and where are they in the map? Now show them to me because I'm, if I'm over here and I've got a little extra time, I want to do the important things, right? Or what can I hit on the way home? Things like that. But it's not a complete to-do system because like a lot of things you don't, a lot of the things you need to do, those 250 things that you're talking about, a lot of them aren't like, you know, on the road there, there, I have to do this when I'm sitting at my computer, I had to send this customer, you know, a, a short analysis of this and I had to do this for this guy, but it was, it's computer work. Right. And I think we all yeah. have that today. So you, you, I think the key is to try to get everything in, in one place on, on that and kind of really be focused or else you get yourself in trouble real fast with a million little notes all over the place. And I think paper is a tough way to do it because you, you too much scratching out and things can get lost and buried. You can't sort paper, I think is the problem. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, there's, there's no, I wouldn't say there's a perfect thing that's, that's solved, you know, all problems for all, all to do problems for all people yet, but I've seen a lot of good ones, but nothing, uh, nothing, nothing's no, getting the job, getting things done, David Allen, nothing's gotten the job done. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> At least not that I've seen, but, uh, well, uh, you know, um, well, what would you say some daily habits are that salespeople can can focus on to build their productivity? Yeah, well, I think one is just to sort of be mindful of things that you're repeating. 
And so if you're doing the same thing over and over again, there's likely a way that you can save time by um, either partially automating that activity or fully automating that activity. And, it, you know, and there's it's, probably an app for that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. There is. There's probably an app for that. And whether it's, you know, it, you know, something like a yes, we're on the email side, but there's probably many other things that, uh, you know, that if you like, you just find yourself doing it again and again, like you should probably go out and search or, you know, or talk to your peers. They maybe have figured something that out um, uh, to, to try to not to keep um, you know, sort of doing it over and over again. And then, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, regular reflection on how you spend your time and whether you feel like you're, you're spending your time in the optimal way, I think is also a, a big productivity hack and something that you can go, you know, sit down and, and talk to your, to your manager about. And, you know, most people won't do this unless they're forced. But an interesting exercise can be you should sort of take a week, you know, and pick an increment that, you know, that is reasonably gran granular, but not so granular. It's super annoying, like 50 every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes or, you know, even an hour. And you just write down what you did, what your primary activity was during that period and try to codify it in some way to say, like, OK, well, this was like selling time or this was driving time or this was like you know, screw around, be unproductive, like whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, you look at that for, you know, a week or two and then you try to try to codify it and say, okay, well, I spent, you know, 20, 20% 20 of my time in actual selling activities. Like, is that right? Is that going to actually get me the results that I want? Um, probably not. And, you know, or not, it might be, but you know, whatever, like that, that, that builds up a picture that you can then say, okay, well, obviously this, activity that's really important isn't getting enough time. And so like, what's going to, what's going to change so that this activity can get more, uh, can get more of my time and, and more of my mind share. And that's where you can start to get into, you know, some of the, the real durable, it's hard, but you can get into some of the real durable changes. If you like really start to get into, you know, um, uh, fundamental shifts in how you're, how you're approaching your work. Uh, those things are typically what's going to be required to get much better results versus, you know, if you just ad adopt a tool, you know, and all of a sudden you, you start sending, you know, 50 emails instead of you send 10, like that's probably not going to really, you know, move the needle. Might very temporarily, but probably not in a durable way. Yeah. Well, next section is sales in 60 seconds. Quick questions and quick answers. First, uh, first question, what common sales practices can, uh, can sales leaders avoid to waste less time? We talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think the uh, my my biggest counsel is when you're doing a coaching session with somebody or you're doing a deal review or whatever it is that you call it, like you should it should really be the vast majority of the time should be focused on strategy and what's going on. It should not be arguing about what's true or not true. And so you got to get yourself into a situation where the the truth sort of shows up and then you argue about what to do with about it versus like arguing about what's true. Yeah. Um are there any uh, great sales tips that have jumped out for you that you've learned from hosting your podcast? Um, sales tips. I mean, a lot of what we talk, like it's, it's pretty, um, we've got a, a bunch of different guests and it ends up being like very domain specific. I'm trying to think of one, I think one that might be, you know, this isn't a sales tip, but I think this is something that is not well understood. Um, I had a, a guest um, who was a partner at a company called ZS Associates who, um, you know, does a lot of work in, in particularly in, in pharma mm -hmm. and, uh, and med devices. And I used to work there. Um, and one of the things that ZS figured out over, um, you know, a lot of different data points and a lot of research was that, you know, in general, um, half of sales productivity or half of sales results can be explained by territory potential versus what the actual salesperson is doing. And so the, it's interesting if you've never gone through, I think it's especially true for the people that you're working with in field sales, because there is actually some physical limitations um, to being able, it's like if you've never gone through a territory rationalization exercise, like you probably are leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, yeah. And so going through that exercise and then getting the territories right. And then, you know, then having the people doing the right things inside of those territories is very impactful uh, from a top line perspective. And if you're a rep, you know, and if you're sort of wondering if you have a fair territory or not, then you, know, you could ask some of those questions. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, there's a, so true and there's a whole whole genre of software now that uh, is actually constantly annoying to me not because they're doing <laughs> anything wrong but just because people type 
So if you type like sales territory management, you might be looking for what we do, or you might be looking for what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so right, we, right. We, we fight with them over a lot of keywords, even though, you know, this, they, we compete on keywords, but not, not compete on product. It's a, it's a, it's a sneaky thing. We, uh, cause it's a whole different area, but like, you know, a line star, there's a bunch of these companies that, um, that, uh, you know, that they, they have software to help people build their territories and figure out, okay, well, I've got these hundred reps. How do I decide which rep goes in? That. What, 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 how many zip codes go in this rep's territory versus that rep? So given where yeah. our, given where our good customers are, our bad customers are. And I, I think that's what, I mean, CS Associates has been doing this for pharma, pharmaceutical companies since before there was software to do it, right? They, they, yeah, I think that was the orig- their original, um, their, this sort of the original thing that the two founders did at Northwestern was they like computerized the traveling postman. Uh, or traveling salesman problem and like mm-hmm. t- 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 built some algorithm that kind of solved it for the first time. So that was the, like the founding innovation. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I remember reading a book about those guys when I was in college, you know, I mean, and so they, they, uh, that's an interesting company. I, I, I know there's still a big company um, yeah. and do a lot in pharma and med device and biotech. Um, and, but, um, uh, what, uh, if you had to pick between motivation or discipline, what do you think is more important for sales? Well, it's it's hard to it's hard to be a good salesperson without motivation. So I, I guess I, I'm going to cheat and probably say that you know uh, you, you have to have motivation. I think discipline without motivation is probably not that useful. But then motivation only carries you so far. And if you're going to really be elite, you know, you, you at some point you're going to have to pick up discipline. Um, but you know, if 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 I can only pick one, I guess I I would I would pick motivation. And as an actionable takeaway, what should the sales managers listen today do uh, as a first step towards improving their whole team's productivity? Well, I think as a first step is to just to take back, take a step back and just see how well you understand it, like how well quantified is what your team, what your team is doing. And if it's not very well quantified, um, you may want to take some steps to, to try to quantify that. And if it is well quantified, then you can start to look at things like, OK, like how often are we you know, experimenting with new stuff? And when we experiment with new stuff, are we identifying the winners? Are we rolling that out? You know, how well is is uh, uh, how well are our sales teams finding share across the, the organization? organization. We, we actually did a study um, looking at our actual data where we, we looked at how often sales teams were sharing data and the ones that were sharing data uh, significantly ended up growing 3x uh, the ones that did not um, share data where, where people just kind of were siloed in their own sets of activities. So there's there are some real wins available there. Very cool. Well, I'm going to try to summarize all the stuff that we've covered here today in, in a couple minutes for all the people that are that are driving and not able to take notes. Um, so first off, first thing we talked about, a common mistake salespeople make is they are starting to streamline their processes is forgetting to personalize messages and emails going, going too big and too broad. Um, also sales manager managers can avoid micromanaging by making sure that there's a shared understanding of the sales process. And uh, so kind of setting those expectations. Uh, you want to choose the right way for or the right. You want to choose the right people for your sales team by hiring people who really think from the buyer's perspective. And this way of uh, th- this way of looking at building your sales team will, will often build out a culture on the team that uh, that's really helpful. That because they're looking to collaborate with people, so they're a more collaborative group. They'll they'll be better at more apps to teach one another things. Um, the more you can, the more things you can measure, the more success you can see in sales, uh, whether you're a, a manager or an, or an individual sales rep, you want to create processes that start from a place of, of, uh, uh, of thinking about what you want to measure. And then you want to think of who you're selling to, and then you want to, test out your different successful processes here your, your, and figure out, you know, AB testing almost. Well, I tried this and, and I tried, I tried this 10 times and that 10 times and which, which process worked better and uh, got me, got me more of the results I was looking for. And I think this is especially important if you're, 
in like a high velocity sales environment where you know a lot, lot of small deals the more you know, so it's super relevant to like uh selling consumer packaged goods or or software things like that um sales teams can can try out different tools and and uh increase their productivity um tools like like yesware badger maps we we, we both recommended those two and then he also uh, recommended uh, checking out conversation intelligence tools like Gong, revenue intelligence tools like Clary, uh, to-do list management tools, and then learning to follow up better and appropriately. And, and he also recommended uh, getting things done by David Allen, kind of a, a philosophy of how to how to how to get things done. Um, you want to use tools to collect data. And then you want to streamline it so that the information isn't lost and, and, and can actually be used effectively in the future. That's really important, not just to collect the data, but to, to get it in a format that, that you can use it. Be mindful of tasks on your sales team. Um, and, uh, and, and, and always, if, if you're doing something over and over and over again, always ask yourself, is there, is there an app for that? Which is funny because actually a lot of, a lot of companies that end up you know, look using our efficiency software badger. You know, they it comes from some like twenty four year old they just hired, and and they like you know the manager like showed them their job, and they were like, really, I'm supposed to do all this? It feels like there should be an app for that. And they're right. <laughs> they, we get we get brought into like you know a, a more mature company. You just buy like you know one of their new new employees started to use it because they were like, yeah, I was. They asked me to do all this stuff, and I knew there was there had to be someone had to already solve this. With yeah, phone, right. You know, like. Um, I think that's often, that, that's a good, it, we, we want to think like a Gen Zer, you know, like, there's got to be an app for that. There's got to be a, an efficient way. <laughs> like someone had to fix this if it's, if it's, uh, if you're doing the same task over and over again. Um, so, uh, you, you want to increase your productivity by, by really taking stock and thinking about how you're spending your time and, and then. And actually, like you know, writing down how how did I spend my time for the last week, and then think about well, what am I spending a lot of time on that I could optimize? Where should I focus my optimization effort efforts and my my productivity improvement efforts? So, some really cool advice, Joel. Um, really enjoyed all all the all the things you taught us taught us about today. Where where can our listeners read more about your work? How do they reach out to you if they want to learn more from you? Yeah, um, a good resource is uh, yeswar.com. So we've got uh, links to our blog there. We've been writing sales content for, you know, 10 years. It's all free. So um, that, that can be a good resource. Um, if you want to check out the hard sell, you can do that at uh, yeswar.com slash podcast. And uh, you can find me on LinkedIn um, if you want to be in touch there. Uh, or I'm uh, just jstevenson at yeswar.com. Very cool. Well, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. Joel, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, if anyone listening can think of other sales reps who would benefit from learning these types of skills that Joel taught us, definitely share the love and forward this on to them. Um, you got you to be careful telling people to be more productive if you're not their manager, but they, they, they may get annoyed, but you, you got to slowly slide it in. Hey, I really thought this was cool to hear. I found things are beneficial. Um, but anyway, hey, leave a rating for the podcast. If, if you find these helpful, definitely helps spread the word. Uh, Joel, really appreciate you coming today. Um, and take care until next time. Yep, it's a lot of fun. Thanks.